Boa tarde. Como estão vocês? Estão bem? Ótimo. Então, meu nome é Spencer Gibb, sou cofundador e líder do projeto Spring Cloud. Uh, faz cinco anos que eu estou fazendo isso. Então, eu vou tentar fazer esta palestra no português. Tá bom? Se não sei as palavras. <risos> No português, vou falar no inglês. Olha, o que eu trouxe também. Olha. Viva o Brasil. Tá, vamos lá. Então, hoje a gente vai falar... Ok. Hum. Sobre Spring Cloud Gateway e o protocolo R-Socket. Vamos fazer, uh, falar sobre o, o arquitetura reativo, sobre reativo, comunicação reativo e o protocolo R-Socket. Tá bom? Então, Architect reactive architectures. Um, they are fundamentally non-blocking. Usually there's an event loop. So these have been around for a long time, right? JavaScript, um, Netty. So these kinds of architectures have been around for a while. And Spring has started to, to adopt these. And when... Who went to Josh's talk? Blessed is Josh Long. Tá. Então, ele falou um pouquinho sobre isso. E coisa interessante sobre arquiteturas reativas são, é, é back pressure, right? Requests that can be... Reactive architectures don't have a... They don't care if it's synchronous or asynchronous, right? but it has to be non-blocking. But the interesting thing is, is back pressure. So what is back pressure? A colega minha, ela fez isso, e eu estou usando isso. O questor fala, quero. O responder, aqui. Ah, demais, ah, preciso ajuda. Então isso é back pressure, porque o requestor pode dizer, para. Bem, ele não fala para, ele fala, quero cinco, ou quero dez, ou quero vinte. E o responder vai dar. Então, ficou melhor, né? So, quem já, já ouviu falar de Reactive Streams? É um projeto de... That many companies have have contributed to, there are four interfaces, these four here, publisher, subscriber, subscription, and processor. Um, and in spring, we use Project Reactor um, is our implementation of, of reactive streams. And so, Josh, if you saw Josh's talk, you saw fluxes and monos and things like that. Now, you won't see much of that here, but it's all built on top of, of that. So, there are roadblocks in using reactive architectures everywhere, right? Data access. Not everyone can use Mongo or Apache or Cassandra, right? Um, so, Pivotal has taken on project uh, R2DBC. Josh showed you a little bit about that. So, Things are starting to progress with data access. But there's still this problem across processes. And so across the network, you know, how do you translate these concepts across the network? So that's where our socket comes in. Turns out I'm, I'm forgetting lots of the Portuguese words right now. <laughs> so it's more English than Portuguese. You know. 
Disculpe. Um, because here, I would, yeah, there was no chance here. So our socket is bidirectional. It's multiplex. We'll talk about each one of these keywords that make our socket interesting. Um, as a protocol, it supports four, four different communication models: um, fire and forget, request response, uh, request stream, request channel. So you can do all sorts of things, right? Uh, that you would normally do with, say, HTTP. Um, another interesting thing about our socket, as we talk about, is that it's transport agnostic. So there are implementations that run over TCP, web sockets. So whatever your network can support, you can usually run our socket over it. Um, oh, that's not what I wanted. Sorry. So let's talk a little bit. It may help to understand our socket by comparing it with, with uh, HTTP. So the first thing, generally with HTTP, your clients are making a connection to the server every time, right? With our socket, you make a single connection to the server, and then all your requests go over the same connection. So the cost, the cost of making a connection, fazendo conexão, doesn't matter much because you only do it once. And then there's, there's multiplexing. So given this single connection, all the requests go across it, and there is a single, every stream or request um, has an ID. And so you can reuse this connection. It's very efficient in networking because you're only using the one connection. And it's persistent, right? It stays open for a long time. The other thing we, we chat a little bit about is, is communicating BRAC pressure, right? There's really only HTTP error codes, right, to deal with. And they're not always very helpful, right? If you get a 503 from the server, KK, oh, I'll see. But with our socket, the, each side of the connection can, can communicate with the other side about how much data it can send or how much data it can receive. And so that back pressure can go across the network. And I'll show you, that's really my demo when I show it to you a little later. So, I mean, some network protocols have pieces of back pressure, like TCP, but there are still places where buffers can overrun, right? Um, and so, I, like, I really like this last statement here that, that one of my colleagues wrote. Reactive streams pull push back pressure ensures that data is only materialized and transferred when the receiver is ready to process it. Right? That just doesn't happen in in HTTP, right? Like, you're, it's going to get sent no matter what if you requested it. So another interesting thing is that once you make a connection, then either side of that connection can be the requester, which is different. In HTTP, even in HTTP 2, where there's bidirectional communication, um, I think you actually talk about that here, that the client still has to ask for data, and then the server can make responses. But with our socket, once you have the connection, it's, it's bi-directional, and it doesn't matter. And you have to stop thinking in client-server terms, because you don't know which one is which, and think in requester-responder terms. Another interesting... Uh, thing about our socket is being able to, to cancel requests. So say the requester it makes a request, and then it determines, you know what, I already have the information I need. I can go cancel that request. Um, and another one is, is resumption of, of requests. So Facebook is one of the companies behind our socket, and they take advantage of resumption on their mobile device, their mobile app, right? So when you 
you leave home and the Wi-Fi drops. There's that little time when you don't have a network connection, right? And so Facebook used to go grab your whole stream again. It was very expensive. But now they use our socket and its resumption support and they just the client says, oh, I was here. And so then it only returns the difference um, in what was requested rather than the whole thing again. So saving real dollars in bandwidth for, for, for companies. So another interesting property of our socket is that it is message driven. So think of it more like you might a message broker, you know, like RabbitMQ or something like that. My daughter has a clarinet lesson, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, so it, it has those semantics and in fact, in the RSocket integration with Spring, it doesn't look like WebFlux does, like WebMVC. It actually hooks into the Spring message mapping um, API. The, the protocol is framed um, so that the messages are split up, split up. It's binary, so it's very fast. Right, there could be some issues. That's one of the reasons people like JSON, right? Because you can just look at it and see it. But it's, it's super inefficient. I, I always think someone asked me the question, you know, like, what does your server, what do all your servers do at work? They're, they're JSON parsers, right? <laughs> we spend all our cycles parsing JSON. Um, so this, this can definitely help with that. You know, it can be JSON, it could be XML, it doesn't matter, protobufs, whatever you want to send across the wire, it can. And another interesting thing is that the payload could be encrypted even if the transport that you're using is not encrypted. Um, and with each request, there's some metadata surrounding the payload. Um, there's MIME type, and then kind of this bag of, of bits that can be used to carry information about payload. Pivotal has been working with Netify and other companies to define some metadata for announcement and routing that I'll, I'll kind of show you here in a little bit. Um, but that means that you can use that bit of metadata to determine you know, what piece of, of your application handles that message, right? And so, you can send messages across the same connection, you know, the, whatever the message may be, right? You don't have to open a specific connection for this type of messages, a different connection for that one. They all go over the same, same connection. So Spring is adding support for our socket. Um, it's coming in, in Spring 5.2. There's already been one or two milestones of, of framework. Spring Boot will auto-configure uh, your RSocket server for you. You know, we're looking at, at working with Spring Security to, to, to add its goodness to um, secure the protocol. So when you think about RSocket, the, if you think about when you make an HTTP connection, you really don't know how many machines that connection has traversed, right? So similar to our socket, you know, it, it really doesn't matter how many machines it's traversed, but there does need to be something smart in the middle that knows how to route um, your R socket connections. And so that's what we've started to build with, with Spring Cloud Gateway. H anyone heard of Spring Cloud Gateway before? A few of you, right? So this Traditionally, it's been an H HTTP gateway, right? Similar to, we were to Zool that we, from, from Netflix, but in this implementation, it's not HTTP, it's RSocket. So the RSocket Java library is built using Project Reactor from Spring, and which is already native to Spring, which is great, and Spring Boot auto-configures things for us, and we, we get a lot of goodness out of that so that 
the gateway R socket module can be very narrow in what it, what it does. So what does it do? So um, come on. Peace. So a gateway deployment might look like this: a small cluster of gateway instances and then R socket clients that connect to it. Um, and the communication is routed from, for example, the Java client on one side through one or two gateways to you know, perhaps a JavaScript client on the other side. So the other thing that's nice about our socket is it's polyglot, right? Doesn't matter, you know, obviously the spring guys, we're gonna do Java, but Facebook use, they're the maintainers of the C++ library. There's a um, Python one, a Go one, right? JavaScript one, so I've seen demos you can use the JavaScript library directly in the browser over WebSockets. So you can have, you know, directly from a, this JavaScript client, could be a browser, right? Doesn't matter. So when you connect, the client makes a connection to the gateway, right? It doesn't, the gateway doesn't connect to the client. And when it connects, it sends some metadata that says, who am I, right? Basically a name and an ID. So it's interesting is that when a client makes a connection, it can be secured in such a way that no incoming connections are allowed, right? We all have these problems in whatever IaaS we're using, whether it's AWS or Azure or whatever, right? Setting up the firewall rules to only let certain things in on this port or that port from these networks, right? Imagine what your security people would say if you could say no incoming connections whatsoever. The gateways need them, but the clients do not. You can just totally shut off all access to that machine, right? That's the ultimate security, isn't it? No connections allowed, that's almost as good as unplugging it from the internet. Um, and that bit of metadata here on the right runs through a filter. And then the gateway can say, you can set up custom filters where you could say, is this client actually allowed to connect to me? Right? So you can set up security at both levels from a connection standpoint. Another interesting thing that happens is because a client sends this little bit of metadata, right? its name and its ID, the gateway has to build a routing table so that it knows when it gets a connection that wants to go to service A, where to send it, right? In essence, it's building this routing table and it becomes a service registry system and a discovery system, right? You don't have to run something else that its sole job is to do service registration and discovery. It basically handles that that uh, that function for you. So when you make so again, clients already connected. We don't have to make another connection. Now we can start making requests. So we make a request, and you send a little bit of metadata. And the other thing thing that's interesting about our socket is the protocol is designed to be extensible, um, and so this metadata that I'm talking about, we're working with to um, formalize this into an extension of the protocol. So it's not just, you know, some random thing we're coming up with, but it will be formalized as part of a, as an extension to the protocol. So when you make a request, you send this little bit of metadata. I want to talk to, you know, service A, and I want to call for what, you know, for better lack, the echo method on service A, right? So what does that look like? So here, just as an example, the Java client's trying to call the JavaScript client, and we, we want the destination echo. And this request will get routed through, you know, how many, one or two gateways to get there. But you'll notice the client 
it doesn't need client side load balancer, right? The load balancing is built into the gateway, right? If there's more than one service A, the gateway will be smart enough to pick one. Um, there's no, there's no service mesh. There's no sidecar running, right? There's no duplication of processes that that come with something like a sidecar. And another interesting thing, there doesn't need to be a circuit breaker in the client as well. And that goes back to to the back pressure that can be communicated across across the network. So but what happens, so there's an interesting situation that you can, you can get yourself into here. You can connect to a gateway and make a request to a service that isn't connected to the gateway yet, right? So what happens? So what we've done is we've built into to the gateway a system such that when a request comes for a service that doesn't exist, we create this placeholder. And basically what happens is we use Reactor and apply back pressure across the network. And one of the things this does is, you know, how many of you have come to the situation where I'm spinning up a new environment, right? But I need to start this service first, and then that one, and then that one, and then I can start the last, right? I see you laughing, but it's, it happens, you know, when you spin up test environments or whatever for the first time, and it's very difficult. You, what do you end up doing? You, you have you set up retry with exponential back off, right? So that you can hopefully in the window of your retry before it dies, the new thing, the other thing comes up and it will work. So in this case, you don't have to deal with any of that because the gateway will handle it for you. And another thing that happens, just like at the connection level, at the requester level, each request runs through a series of filters that can be customizable. And again, you can apply security here such that, hey, can this service actually talk to that other service, right? There are lots of highly regulated environments where you, know, you don't want all your services, you know, the, there's some segregation that needs to happen. And you can do that on arbitrary metadata that you provide or simply based on the names and, and destinations. So we've tried to plug in, provide the hook points you need to add security at whatever layer you need to. So I talked through most of that. Another thing that we do is collect metrics. So has anyone heard of micrometer? A few of you? Spring Boot? OK. So we built micrometer at, at Pivotal to be the new metrics implementation in Spring Boot 2. So if you've used Spring Boot 2, you've used micrometer. Um, and what we've done in our socket and in the gateway is set up micrometer such that it collects metrics at various different levels in the gateway, right? As an, at a general level, at a connection level, and also we take care of requests, um, metrics at the request level. So you can see rates of messages flowing from service A to service B, for example. Something that could be very, very useful that often is very, very hard to get. Um, and we do it all in one central place. All right, so let's get to some demos. So this is the demo setup that I'm eventually going to get to. Um, and I'm going to show some simpler versions of this, specifically first without a gateway, right, to show that these applications, relatively unchanged, work, right? They can communicate directly with each other. One actually is a server. It has to listen to a connection. That's the small change. But uh, other than that, it should just, should just work. So my demo application is very, very 
complicated. Who here has played ping pong? How do you say ping pong in Portuguese? Ping pong. Ping pong, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I went to McDonald's once and asked for a milkshake and, and the, the girl just looked at me. I want a milkshake. She said, I don't understand. Quero milkshake. Oh, why didn't you say so? <laughs> I did say so. <laughs> All right. So, let me show you the ping application here. You see that all right? Building there? Watch them all. Basically what this does is that most of it is not super interesting. One bit here is this is how I create metadata to say I'm a ping, right? So that Gateway knows who I am. And we set that here. And then here is where we actually send a message, right? I have a method called send pings. And if you saw Josh's demo, a flux is a stream of things, in this case of payloads. And so every second, I'm going to send a ping to the server. An almost an identical implementation on the Pong side. Right, like I said, the, the little bit is, am I a server or not, basically, because I have to listen if I'm actually going to do it. So here if I say, if I run Pong, Yeah, I didn't try and code like Josh does. He's a professional live coder, and I'm an amateur live coder. So my day job is actually building something. <laughs> no, <laughs> no disrespect to Josh. He builds things all the time, but his day job is, is to do presentations. <laughs> anyway, sorry, Josh. Um, yeah, that didn't, that didn't come out right. All right, so here I connected. So this is ping and pong directly connected to each other, OK? You can see both sides sending and receiving, OK? So this, I did a request channel, which is a long running request, right? Many inputs to many outputs. Um, Right, so this is, there's no gateway in the middle. Okay, so that's just me proving that this stuff works. So now if I come and run gateway, so now we're at this picture but with just one, okay? So I run the gateway, I run my ping application. So there's no Pong server, right? I haven't run that yet. So you can see it's every second it's printing this, this statement here. So let me show you what is actually... So this is gateway applying back pressure across the network, right? It says, I don't have, I can't respond to that message right now. And what I had to do is do on back pressure something, right? So if you look at what you can do in Reactor, you can do all sorts of different things when back pressure is applied. Um, you can buffer, you can drop them, you can 
throw an error, or whatever the case may be, right? But these are just, it's really, really interesting that the semantics of our socket follow the same semantics of reactive streams such that these methods translate directly across the network. When I got this working, so in computer science programming, things really just work the first time, right? You, don't, you try them and it fails and you figure out what you did wrong. When I did this the first time and it worked, I was like, wait, I'm sure like I'm missing something in the middle and that this didn't happen, but it just worked. The back pressure just propagated across the network. So this is where you would deal with, you know, uh, something akin to a circuit breaker fallback, right? Now, you probably couldn't handle all of your services being down for minutes or even hours, right? But in startup, for example, like we're showing here, this is pretty useful, right? So let's go ahead and run run Pong. And then all of a sudden, it's receiving pings, and it just started, right? I didn't have to retry, I didn't have to hope that, you know, whatever, I didn't have to do, it just, it just worked, okay? So now, let's close these. So when you run, so now we're getting to my actual picture here, right? So I'll start gateway one. So in this case, the second gateway is going to connect to the first one, right? Basically your cluster of gateways would have to know about each other. Um, but that should be a fairly small number of them. So we've connected, and again, I'll do the same demo I did before. Oh, I guess I introduced a bug. So again, Neither one of gateway one nor gateway two has a pong to respond. And so we get that same back pressure. And I will start pong this time pointing to gateway two instead of gateway one. So we can see it started, it started to work. So what happened is that Pong registered with gateway two. Gateway two told gateway one that I have one. And when, when it told gateway one that, it went, oh, gateway one said, ah, I'm looking for that. And so it, it actually gave the request from ping the R socket connection to gateway two, right? It didn't give the connection to the Pong server. It just gave the connection to gateway two. And so it went, two hops. But again, usually when people think, oh no, another network hop, that's bad, right? Because why do they think that? Usually it's bad because what do you have to do? You have to make a connection, which is expensive. But here you don't. There was, the connection was already there. So the request over the already open connection was very fast. Now there's going to be physics involved, right? But it should be very, very small. All right. So that is demo. I guess I can leave those running. It doesn't matter. So here's some of the things we talked about that you don't need in this kind of setup. Your services don't need incoming permissions, right? They can be totally blocked. They just make an outbound connection to the gateway. And then you just have to secure the gateway, right? Some small number of them. And we have ideas about 
you could run a gateway cluster, for example, in one region and another in another and have them connected over a wide area network or VPN or something like that and do some intelligent load balancing. For example, if generally the connections across, the requests across the, to the other region would be slower, right? Because they're going across the country or whatever or across the ocean. But for example, if a service died in the local region, well, a slow service is better than, better than no service, right? Um, we talked about that there isn't a need for a separate service discovery system. <coughs> now, I've built Spring Cloud on integrating service discovery systems, right? You've heard of Eureka before, maybe? You? Yeah, console, anyone? Zookeeper? What other service discovery systems do you use? Anyone? A different one? Okay. So, so we don't need something separate for that. We don't necessarily need a service broker. If your messages don't need durability, for example, they're just kind of these ephemeral messages, you know, rather than rest calls, right? If, if we think about message-oriented systems instead of you know, request response-based systems, this kind of thing fits right in, and you don't need a separate message broker. We talked about the need for eliminating circuit breaker, right? We can use the built-in back pressure from, from Reactor and our socket. We don't need a client-side load balancer like Ribbon, right? You don't need a library. This is super helpful when you're polyglot, right? Because with Eureka or Ribbon, it's like, ah, how do I, how do I integrate that? Because now I want to use, you know, our front end guys want to use Node, right? Whoever has that problem. Um, so you don't need that, right? A sidecar, a service mesh. Um, the CTO of Netify said that they, they ran a demo. They took the canonical Istio application and put it on some hardware in a cloud, ran it, benchmarked it. They then replaced Istio with our socket on the exact same hardware and immediately got lower latency and more requests per second. And then they scaled it and kept getting better and better um, uh, performance. And he said, we stopped because it would just get a little slower every time, right? Just because of the ability for the back pressure to propagate across the network, right? Think services would not go down, they would just get a little slower. We talked about um, startup ordering problems. You don't, you don't have to deal with that. Um, our friends at Netflix talk about uh, an application of theirs that takes, I don't know, say tens of minutes, maybe even an hour to warm up, right, before it can start taking requests, right? So they use um, Eureka and its ability to do some things to, to Basically, they bring it up, register it with Eureka with out of service. Then once it's warm, they send a message. But if we use something like our socket, it could just be not available until it was ready. Um, and there are certain cases where with, with this kind of architecture, a thundering herd can be avoided. Uh, so we talked about some of these good things from our socket persistent connections that are multiplexed, where you get multiple transports. So one of the things I envision is a, you know, a couple of our socket servers that live on the edge, right, that then are connected to your um, private R socket servers, right? So the ones on the edge may speak web sockets, right, or they may speak TCP, depending, you know, so your, your mobile apps, your web apps could, could talk directly to those and then they could talk directly to your interior um, cluster. Again, polyglot, this would all work. Just, in fact, I, I, I meant to do it, write a little JavaScript ping client, right? And the only thing you need to send is that little bit of metadata with your, with your requests. And that we can, we get all this, this data that's um, incoming from micrometer. So, 
the roadmap that we are looking at, we, we have some clustering enhancements to do. Another interesting thing is that because the cluster knows about all of these services, there are times when it's interesting to say, I want to send a message to all instances of a service, right? Some kind of coordination message or some kind of administrative message, right? So we would like to be able to do that, right? And you could add a little piece of metadata to your fire and forget message that said, you know, send this message to everyone. Again, my daughter's clarinet lesson. Um, or it might be an interesting thing to do, uh, send a message to multiple servers and get the first reply, right? The fastest one back. So you send it to two or three and the fastest one wins, right? Called request hedging. Um, we want to, one of the extensions to the RSocket protocol is for tracing. Um, you've heard of Zipkin before, open tracing, okay? So the ability to figure out, pinpoint where in your system requests are slow, right? Um, there are other things that we can do for optimizing routing. You know, we, I talked a little bit about that intelligent load balancer that could say, hey, we're, it's faster over here. That, that is work that is to be done. Um, so this is, we're targeting this for uh, the third quarter of this year um, as part of Spring Cloud Hoxton. This will come with the, the work that is done in Spring Framework and Spring Boot, and we are targeting the third quarter. Preguntas. Okay. No? Tá? Muito obrigado.